So, we're going to now give the floor to our first speaker of the morning. It's uh, Ms. Maria Hernández. She is a partner of the Compliance Department of Eversheads Nicea. I hope I pronounced that good. Um, she has uh, been responsible of the legal counsel of Penter for Southern Europe and the Chief Compliance Council of Europe. She has also belonged to the supervision bodies of the control model and management of several Italian companies. She has been also awarded with many prizes and she is, uh, uh, her professional career uh, is a real example of, of the knowledge she has on, on these issues. So thank you for, for coming today, Maria, and we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Marisa. Um, hello, everyone. Um, well, as Marisa said, my name is Maria Hernandez. What I'm trying to do here is to put a very practical perspective into the subject matter. So I'm bringing my experience from international organizations. I've been in charge of designing and implementing compliance programs worldwide. I had a position in the United States as well in a company that reached a settlement agreement with the Department of Justice and the Securities Exchange Department. So we needed to prove the efficiency of the compliance program on a worldwide basis. So I'm going to present here very briefly what the new or oh, the reformed Spanish criminal code indicates, which, to be honest with you, there is nothing new under the sun. It's just following what other legislations and international treaties have in their provisions. I'm, I'm going to focus especially on the red flags that you or we identify when talking about corruption. And I'm going to do it in a manner as if you were members of a company, of the board of directors of a company, to whom I need to, t to train on identifying these red flags. So please interrupt me at any time. You don't need to wait until the end if you have any questions. And uh, I hope you find this uh, presentation useful. Can you hear me correctly? OK. So where to start? If you have a compliance uh, need in an organization and you have a company that is present in many different countries, you are suddenly puzzled with all of these different legislations. So, for example, you have the USA Foreign Corrupt Practice Act, 1977, very, uh, I wouldn't say ancient, but one of the first pieces of legislation. And this is important for the reasons I will mention afterwards. We also have uh, our neighbors, at least the ones in Spain, our Italian Legislative Decree 231 from 2001, I'm mentioning this one because the reform of the Spanish criminal code follows very closely with this uh, legislation we saw in Italy. We also have the UK Bribery Act 2010, important because it's even stricter than the provisions that we found in the US legislation. So nowadays, international companies, when thinking about the elements of a compliance program, we tend to look at the UK Bribery Act more so than the FCPA, the US legislation, which was the case uh, beforehand. And then in Spain, as it was mentioned by uh, our uh, officers before me, uh, we have a reform of the criminal code in 2010, which introduced the criminal liability of uh, the legal entities. And very recently, coming into effect on July 1st, so a couple of months ago, a new reform that actually follows what other legislations had already established in their past in relation to also the elements of a compliance program in order to be considered a preventive measure for an organization and an affirmative defense for corporates in relation to criminal liability. Obviously, we all know there are also international conventions fighting corruption. I'm just mentioning here some of them. We also heard about the framework decision uh, in 2003. All of these set of rules and legislations provide the framework when talking about international expansion. Clearly, legislations in your country, the country that we have represented here, would also need to be taken into consideration if you're looking at implementing an effective program. The good news are that most of them follow the same structure. Most of them ask for the same type of elements for a prevention of criminal liability of the corporations. 
So when talking about uh, the Spanish criminal code following the legislative decree in Italy, the code talks about an organizational management and control model that needs to be in place to provide companies with an exemption in case of crimes committed by their employees, officers, or individuals acting on behalf of the company. There are certain requisites uh, for the compliance program to be considered effective. First of all, the board of directors, they need to adopt this organizational management model prior to the perpetration of the crime. Supervision of the model is entrusted to an individual or a committee with independent powers of initiative and control, what is called in the corporate environment a compliance officer, or for example in Italy, the uh, Organismo di Vigilanza Supervisory Board of the Compliance Program. The individual authors of the crime committed the offense while intentionally and fraudulently eluding the model. The model was well fitted to the reality and it could prevent the crime, but the people who actually committed the crime had to fraudulently elude it in order for it to be materialized. The compliance officer or supervisory body has not neglected, neglected its duties of supervision and controls. So what are the elements that we see under the Spanish Criminal Code? And we find the same elements in many of uh, legislations around the world. Risk assessment, policies, procedures and controls, financial management system, obligation to report any irregularities, through a whistleblowing channel or through any mechanism that the company may deem appropriate for their reality. For example, a small, medium companies, a good, why not, model to report irregularities would be to knock on the door of the compliance officer and just explain what's going on. Important is to have the non retaliation policy. Without that, the reporting mechanism would not work. Disciplinary system, if you're not enforcing, the provisions, there's not going to be effectiveness. And then a periodic verification and changes to the model in case of significant violations occurring or in case of changes that I will explain later on. Obviously, I'm not going to talk about all of this. You may be familiar. These are the top 10 Foreign Corrupt Practice Act cases of all times. These are cases in which companies have reached agreements with the Department of Justice and the Securities Exchange Commissions in some uh, circumstances, uh, settling bribery charges or accounts and record provisions. Why am I showing you this? Just to say that 80% of the cases are non-USA. We're talking about USA legislation applying with extraterritorial outreach to companies around the world. And precisely for this reason is why I like to focus on the guidelines that were set by the uh, Department of Justice and the Securities Exchange Commission in relation to the elements of a compliance program. Many of them, as you see, similar to what we saw in the Spanish Criminal Code, the recent reform, some of them more advanced, explicit mention to training and communication. We don't find it in the Spanish Criminal Code, but it's obvious that if you put in place a program that is very comprehensive, it's going to be useless if you don't communicate or train people on how to do it. So tone at the top, important. You saw it, it's the board of directors that need to implement the compliance program. They are the ones that set the culture of compliance at the organization. So they need to have a very clear articulated compliance uh, policy with company standards, and they need to enforce this throughout the organization. Code of conduct, policies and procedures. The code of conduct is the core of a com corporate compliance program. It establishes the values of the corporation, but also the general principles that will then be developed through company policies. It needs to be clear, concise, and again, accessible to all employees. Otherwise, who's going to know about this? It has to be preferable in local language, periodically review and update it because of new risks that the company might be facing, and it will require an annual affirmation by directors and officers. These are best 
practices. It's not that this is mandatory, but this is what the Department of Justice, Securities Exchange Commission, all their tribunals around the world are looking for when looking at the policies and procedures. Uh, really depend on the size and nature of the business and the risk associated with it. If you put in place a compliance program by copy pasting it from Google, for example, that's gonna be useless because what you need to be doing is to tailor a specific risk that your company is facing and putting in place the control mechanism to avoid them, prevent them, eradicate them, or control them. Therefore, you need a deep understanding of the company business model and its risk. I'm gonna be talking a little bit more on the risks that the company may face, so just to provide you with an example. Oversight, autonomy, and resources, obviously. If you have a compliance department that is not autonomous, well, how am I gonna tell you if I witness something that is wrong? I am gonna be afraid for my job, etc., because I know you will probably dismiss me. So you need to have a compliance officer, preferably reporting out of the chain of command of the chief executive officer directly to the board of directors so that they can raise any issues without fear of retaliation. Important as well, and this is key, you need resources. What does that translate into? Money. When you are in front of a board of directors, if you're ever in front of the board of directors trying to convince them on the need to put in place this program, they want to see how much this is gonna cost. In my experience, the best is to show them the slide with the fines that I showed in the past, talking about billion, million of dollars. What's the cost of not having a compliance program? And then the reporting structure will depend on the size and complexity of an organization. Obviously, big multinationals, they can have a very complex compliance structure with regional compliance officers in each of their territories, Latin America, Asia, etc. Small and medium companies, you may find that the compliance officer is actually the general director of the company. And that could be fine as long as he or she exercises its duties in accordance with the requirements of the law. But just to let you know, uh, the Spanish Criminal Code also contemplates explicitly the possibility to have the management of the company exercising the functions of a compliance officer. Risk assessment, that's the fourth element, and I would say this is the base of the whole compliance program. Reason why, in my view, uh, the Spanish Criminal Code has said it as the first element of a compliance program needs to be tailored to the operating reality of the company. Why? Because once you've put in place the risk assessment of your activities, you are gonna have to decide how many resources you allocate in each area to prevent the risk of certain crimes happening. But what do I assess in terms of risk? Well, first of all, country and industry the business opportunity you have in front of you, the potential business partners, the level of involvement with governments, the exposure to customs and immigration in conducting business affairs. So company risk, there are risks that are inherent to the company, why? For example, private companies with a close shareholder. It doesn't mean that it's wrong, it just means that you need to take a careful look at the composition of the board of directors, if there is one, which obviously there is, but also of uh, the shareholder. Large, diverse, and complex group with the centralized management structure, what could this indicate? A lack of control from the headquarters. So the risk could be higher in this type of companies. Autocratic top management, you don't accept any feedback, negative feedback. You have to do the things as I tell you to do the things. No excuses, you need to sell 300 million in this territory. I don't care how you do it, find your way, but you need to reach your sales target. <gasps> there is an incentive maybe there, hidden, for potential corruption in order to obtain public contracts. Poor marketplace perception, which we'll talk about, 
and previous history of compliance issues. Internal risk, do your employees know uh, what your company is all about? Do you know where you are operating? Have your employees been trained? Uh, do you understand the company's compensation structure? Is it too aggressive for the reasons I mentioned? Are the sales objectives too aggressive, almost encouraging you to bribe in order to obtain contracts? Lack of clarity in the policy on gifts, entertainment, and travel expenses. Why do I mention these themes? Gifts, entertainment, and travel expenses, I think it's quite clear. Corruption or bribing is not only about money, it's anything of value that the recipient finds. So it could be being invited to a very expensive restaurant or being offered a tour trip around the world or even giving employment to my daughter, to uh, my husband. That is something of value to me and I could be bribed, not me, but I mean it's an example, uh, for this type of actions. And then you have the country risk. And uh, for this, if uh, I believe you might already be aware of this, there is Transparency International, which edits every year the list of, uh, it's an index called corruption perception in the public sector. Corporate uh, multinationals look at this map when identifying the territories and the controls that they need to put in place. I strongly encourage you, if you haven't done so, to enter into the webpage of Transparency International and look at the different uh, categories that you find in there, the elements that are taken into consideration when uh, establishing these indices. Uh, so absence of anti-bribery legislation, lack of implementation, perceived lack of government capacity or non-enforcement, no punishment even if there is corruption in the marketplace, even if there is legislation on corruption. All of these needs to be taken into consideration when assessing the risk. So you're a company operating in Spain, in Letonia, Lithuania, Denmark, and suddenly, not suddenly, but through uh, extends uh, study, you decide to expand your activities in Eastern Europe, even Eastern, or Asia, or Latin America. So what do you do first? You look at this. That's what corporations do. And see where is the main source of risk in each of those countries. Transaction risk. Well, is it the same to um, talk about a transaction involving charitable or political contributions? There is a red flag in terms of corruption there. Transactions that need licenses and permits from the government in order to take place are also considered of high risk. Public procurement, same. High value of projects with many contractors and the involvement of intermediaries or agents, which I'm gonna dedicate uh, a, a, a part of the presentation, highlighting the red flags. But there are also risks associated to the person to, with whom you conduct business. So the use of third party representatives, this could be sales agents, subcontractors, even law firms could bring bribery issues to you. Elevating number of consortium partners or joint venture partners, you need to control the people you are working with. If there are many, it might become more difficult. And then relationships with politically exposed persons. And we'll talk about this as well. Finally, sector risks. There are areas traditional that need a bigger amount of government licensing usually relating to the natural resources of a country. For example, extractive industries, oil and gas services, we are seeing major scandals. It just came to my mind, Brazil, Petrobras. So natural, uh, large-scale infrastructure, road, construction, railway, telecoms, pharmaceutical, medical advice, healthcare, and financial services. All of the regulated markets expose your companies to a higher degree of risk. Wanted to give you this slide, not to read through it, but just to let you know these are the crimes under Spanish legislation that could raise the criminal liability of corporate entities. So the first thing, apart from looking at all of the elements that you saw beforehand, the first thing you need to understand 
is which of these crimes could actually be exposed your company to. Example, you work in a hotel environment. Would you be affected by um, money laundering? Maybe, it's not a good example, but you could certainly be affected by prostitution. So this is a risk that you need to take into consideration when identifying what you can be exposed to and even harder control mechanisms need to put in place. Would that be the case in a financial institution? If you're looking at a financial institution identifying risk, would you look at prostitution as one of the main areas of risk? Probably not, but you will look at money laundering. So just to give you an example of the type of mechanism in order to conduct a risk assessment. This is a traditional risk matrix example. You need to assess the likelihood and the impact of the different crimes. For example, this could well be a pharmaceutical company. We see uh, on the top right in red, Article 288, which is against the industrial and the intellectual property, the market and consumers. Why? Pharmaceuticals have a risk of patent infringement. What happens if all of your products suddenly are denounced for not having respected the rights of other uh, companies? Well, the impact could potentially imply a stoppage. And the likelihood, in case there are not the control mechanism in place, is high. So resources need to be immediately put in place to address that specific risk. In the case of 156 article, traffic of uh, illegal traffic of human organs, something pharmaceuticals also need to take into consideration when identifying the risk. The impact will be major, obviously. The likelihood is regular. Why? Because you may have all the mechanisms already in place. Article 310b, this is crimes against the tax authorities and the social security. Also, one of those that can raise the criminal liability of your companies. We see it here in this example, hypothetical, as minimal in impact and possible in likelihood. Why is it minimal in impact? The impact would be huge if you don't have the control mechanism in place. In this case, the company has very strong control mechanisms, and therefore we consider that at this moment in time, and this is important, risk assessment needs to be done in a moment in time because it will evolve with the controls. At this moment in time, this doesn't represent a high, high area of risk. Training and development, I think uh, there is no much explanation that needs to be given, just to ensure that training is not only given to your employees, uh, but also ensure you provide training to the third parties you work with. Ideally, with the sales agents, uh, those are the most problematic. And many corporations work through sales agents or sales representatives because of cost effectiveness. Instead of opening an office in the Middle East, in Dubai, well, Dubai is quite, yeah, let's talk about other countries, but let's say Dubai, okay. Uh, they hire a sales agent that is by himself or herself in the territory. What is this guy, woman doing? You need to train these people. And then the most sophisticated uh, element that has been added to the list, and according to my experience, this is very difficult to convince the board on, you need to give incentives in order to measure the degree of compliance. For example, through personal evaluation and promotions, rewards for improving and developing a company's compliance program. How? Attending training sessions that hopefully your company has put in place. Ideally, but difficult, put a metric for management bonuses relating to compliance. 0.3% of your annual bonus will depend on the number of training sessions you've attended, on the number of meetings you've had with your employees, talking about real cases scenarios that you find in the market on compliance. Regarding good behavior and sanctioning bad behavior reinforces the culture of compliance and ethics throughout an organization. I talk about culture of compliance frequently because at the end of the day, I believe the whole of the compliance structure 
can be assured if you do have the culture of compliance emanating from the top of the organization throughout uh, the different levels. Third party due diligence and payments. As I say, third parties uh, represent a very high level of risk, and this is demonstrated by the most recent uh, settlement agreements reached with corporations. There is a principle of willful blindness that may represent that your company can be held liable even if you didn't know anything about what your third party was doing. So they are usually uh, commonly used to conceal the payment of bribes to foreign officials. I'm not paying myself to obtain this contract because they could catch me. I'm going to hire him to pay the public official um, a bribe so that I get the contract in direct payment of bribes. What do you need to do with these third party representatives? First, due diligence prior to contracting. Who are these people? What's the composition of the board? Do they have any relations with the public administration? We'll look at all of this later. Once you've decided that they are clean, in a sense, contractual terms include provisions in the contracts that uh, limit the power of these people to contravene. And if they contravene, include provision to penalize how they are doing it, and ongoing monitoring. The people might be acting in one way today. Tomorrow, it may be completely different. So you need to continuously monitor how they perform their activities. Sorry, I'm just going to drink some water. <clears throat> so confidential reporting and internal investigation. Confidential reporting. The biggest issue in relation to confidential reporting is whether it can be anonymous or non-anonymous. The biggest issue, I mean, in terms of uh, corporations. In Spain, it's not allowed for, a corporate, for someone to uh, make an anonymous denounce by the Spanish uh, Data Privacy Agency. It is allowed to be confidential, obviously. How do you overcome? this obstacle, because at the end of the day, if you don't allow people to freely speak without fear of retaliation because they are providing their names, I'm not going to be encouraged to tell you what I'm saying. In Spain and other countries, what people traditionally do in terms of corporations doing it, they hire an intermediary, for example, a law firm like us, and you act as the whistleblower channel. So you will be forced to give your name under the Spanish data privacy provisions, and I reach an agreement with the company that I will not give your name to the company unless you authorize me to do so. Obviously, there are a lot of caveats into this. There might be legal uh, requirements to provide the name, depending on the severity of the allegation. Good compliance programs should constantly evolve. This is a live theory. Legislation change, there is a change in your business model, you are expanding to territories with a very high perception of corruption, for example, according to Transparency International CPI index, the enforcement of the corruption legislation changes in the country, so you need to be extra careful. Or there is a change in the company ownership. Do you have any questions? Okay, so very brief highlight of the elements of a corporate compliance program because I wanted to introduce you to the world of the red flags in bribery. And the first section in this presentation, I want to dedicate it to the risk of third parties. So there is a master list of third party corruption red flags. Reputational risk, government relations, insufficient capabilities, type and method of compensation, and unusual circumstances. So let's look at the reputational risk. The risk that your competitor, not your competitor, sorry, your intermediary 
uh, has bad reputation and could affect your reputation. In compliance, it's very important. It's not only about committing or not the crime, <clears throat> it's also about perception. Why? Because many times the market just acts on perception. Your shareholder value could drastically drop just based on perception. So you need to be careful with commission of crimes, but also the perception that you might be committing a crime. Reputational risk, the transaction or the third party is in a country known for widespread corruption, according to international organizations such as Transparency International. Same map as we saw before. The third party has a history of improper payment practices, illegal conduct or unethical conduct. And this is obvious, you wouldn't want to contract with someone with a history. But sometimes you don't know, because this is a remote location you're working in, so you need to conduct the due diligence. The third party has poor reputation. How do you know this? Well, hopefully you have colleagues also working in the territory that can recommend third parties to you. Also, I'm Maria Hernandez, I'm in the USA, I don't know what's going on in Qatar. Who do I ask about the reputation of a business, third party, sales agent, well, my team in the country, and if I don't have a team in the country because I didn't open operations, ask the industry and their associations for doing so. The third party does not have in place an adequate compliance program or code of conduct or refuses to adopt one. The fact that they don't have in place a compliance program or code of conduct is not exceptional. It's quite common that in certain countries there is nothing like this. But for that, you need to propose to them to adopt one. And if they say, I don't want to adopt that, that's a red flag. There might be legitimate reasons for saying, I don't want to adopt a code of conduct, but at least there is a red flag in there you need to look into. Other companies have terminated the third party for improper conduct. Well, obviously a red flag that you need to look into and investigate. Information provided about the third party or its services of principals is not verifiable by data. They're only telling you that's what they are, that's what they do. But you cannot find data in the market to prove that they are saying the truth. Second uh, red flag category, government relationships. The third party has a family or business relationship with a foreign official or government agency. Again, this is a red flag. It doesn't mean that it's wrong at all. There are certain countries where it's almost 60, 70, 80% of the business people are related to, for example, a royal family. The third party previously worked in the government at high level or in an agency relevant to the work he or she will be performing. They may know people there, they may know who to influence. The third party is a company with an owner, major shareholder, or executive who is an official. A government official requests, urges, insists, demands that a particular party is selected or engaged, particularly if the official has discretionary authority over the business at issue. Why would someone ask me to hire an intermediary, specifically that intermediary, to conduct the business with me? There seems to be a split. Maybe it's a red flag. This is not proven. It's maybe a split of commissions. The third party makes large or frequent political contributions. It may be okay under the legislation of the country, but you need to ensure there is a due diligence on that, also because of the influence that you could have when obtaining contracts in that country. The third party provides lavish gifts or hospitality to government officials. Worldwide tour, uh, let's go uh, drastic, um, Ferraris. Uh, some of these examples may look outrageous, but always take into consideration international circumstances. What might not be seen as a potential bribe in Spain, uh, something valued $100? Would you change your mind in a space for $100? I wouldn't. Some people may, but it's not common. Would you change your mind in a territory such as India for $100? Maybe. 
So this is a red flag in some territories, and you need to put the threshold to ensure it adapts to the local reality of the country where you are operating. The other typical red flag is when you find a third party that actually is not capable of performing the duties they've been hired for. It doesn't have a track of record. What has he or she done in the past? How, does he know the environment she or he is working on? The third party does not have offices or staff. So you are being proposed to appoint a third party, a sales agent. You conduct a first level due diligence and cannot find offices for this person or staff. How is he going to work? The third party has an unorthodox corporate structure. Again, red flags. It may be completely fine. Is there a red flag? That indicates you may need to go into a deeper due diligence. The address of the third party's business is a mail drop location, virtual office, or a small private office that could not hold a business. The site that is claimed, I have a big infrastructure in order to provide you with all the services you need, uh, consulting in order to obtain your contract. Well, okay, I go into due diligence and I don't see an office or staff working for you. How are you going to do this? It may be legitimate. How could it be legitimate? Because once you engage this person, this person hires people. Completely legitimate, a red flag. The third party has not been in business for very long or was only recently incorporated. The third party has poor financial statements or credit. Again, it could be completely okay, but it might be an indication on whether he or she can perform the duties you're gonna give them. The third party's plan for performing the work is vague and or suggests a reliance on contact or relationships. There is not really a description of what I'm going to be doing in order to earn the commission you're going to give to me. I'm just telling you, don't worry, I have a contact here or there and I'll get this contract for you. The other typical uh, red flag that we corporations look at when uh, due diligence in third parties is compensation. Third party requests an unusual advance payment. Why? Does he need to buy someone before being awarded the contract? Or does he need to invest in order to get resources to perform the contract? It could be right, it could be wrong, but it's a red flag. The fee commission or volume discount provided to the third party is unusually high compared to the market rate. Telecommunications company, I need a contractor in Russia. The market rate is usually 3% of the value of the contract in case I get awarded. But this person is asking me for a 15% commission. How is that possible if I can hire any other person to do this for 3% market rate. Well, maybe his or her reputation is higher, or also he or she needs to uh, hire, as I say, more people in order to perform the job or open an office, open, etc. It could be many legitimate reasons, but you need to look into. Obviously, if the third party offers or uh, submit inflated, inaccurate, or suspicious invoices, there's clearly a red flag. Why would he charge you more than agreed? Is he going to be part of that money to a third party or to a contract? Careful with cash, needless to say. And the third party, and I've seen this many times, and many times for legitimate reasons, the third party requests payment in a jurisdiction outside of its home country or in a different currency. Also seen this in many occasions. The third party requests that payment be made to two or more accounts or to an account where the account holder is not the third party you hire, but it could be his or her wife or a national of a state where you don't have citizenship. These are also red flags you need to look into, but it could be completely legitimate as well. The third party requests an afterward service contract that it does not have the capacity to perform 
this is his her remuneration. Request that a donation is made to a charity. Careful with charities, you know this probably better than me, but uh, they've been used uh, for funeling bribes to public officials. The third party refuses to properly document expense or ask for per diems. Uh, per diems in case, uh, I don't know if you're uh, used to the term, but usually when you incur into a, a cost on behalf of a company, I pay for this and then I ask for reimbursement. If the company has a policy of providing per diems, that means that I'm going to give you $100 and I don't care what you do with it. You don't have to justify this is a per diem. And it's completely fine in many circumstances, but it's just a red flag because you don't have to prove where you've spent your money. I'm talking $100, but let's imagine per diem is bigger because of a big infrastructure project and you need to travel remotely, so the trip is going to cost you a lot of money. If you don't have to justify how you spend the money, there is a red flag that you could be spending it, bribing someone. The third party pressures a company to make the payments urgently or ahead of a schedule. And the third party requests a large upfront payment. You are asking me to pay your commission beforehand? Before I even see if I get the contract, why? Is someone else asking you for the money in order for me to get the contract awarded? Things you need to look into. The third party requests payment in another country's currency and also clearly in a tax haven country. Those are typically red flags, could be fine again, but it's a red flag you need to look into. And then there are unusual circumstances that raise your eyebrows when you see them, when someone is proposing to appoint a third party to conduct business on your behalf. The third party refuses to sign commitment to comply with bribery legislation. And this may seem ridiculous, but I've seen this so many times working as compliance officer, especially in legislation or jurisdictions that are not used to have this type of uh, legislation. The third part refuses to warrant past compliance with bribery legislation. Especially when you're acquiring a company, you need to conduct a compliance due diligence. Under FCPA, Foreign Corp Practice Act in the States, for example, you'll have successor liability. You acquire a company that had a history of non-compliance and you might be held liable if you acquire the company in the future if you haven't set caveats in the uh, acquiring agreement. The third party refuses to execute a written contract. Very common in many places not to have a written contract. Well, how are you gonna protect your company if you don't have the written contract to say, I did impose that he or she comply with bribery legislation? The third party insists that its identity remain confidential or that the relationship remains secret. I mean, when you say secret, your eyebrows immediately raise a concern. The third party refuses to divulge the identity, identity of its beneficial owners, directors, officers, or other principals. Why don't you want to tell me who composes your board or who is the owner of your company? Is there a member of the royal family? I, and I don't mean, I mean, I'm thinking about Middle East, not Spain when talking about royal family. But uh, is there a member of the public administration, etc.? And the third party refuses to answer due diligence questions. Take into consideration, many times you are not working with simple contractors. You are working with high reputated people in the territories. And they may have a lot of pride. And they will tell you, well, excuse me, how do you dare? to ask me what's the composition of my board. How do you dare to ask me that I don't have any history of past compliance irregularities? So careful with that. It's a red flag. It might be fine. When I say it might be fine, you still need to have them answering the due diligence questions, but you may need to explain to them why you are asking them and what's the impact. The third party refuses to allow audit clauses in the contract. They will not allow you to go into their offices, into their records, obviously subject to local legislation, just to look at the transaction they did for you. 
there is a suggestion by the third party that otherwise illegal conduct is acceptable because it is the norm or custom in a particular country. Typical excuse. I've heard from, especially from salespeople or from procurement as well. Well, how do you want me to conduct business in this country where all of my competitors are paying bribes in order to obtain the contract? We don't have a good position because everyone else is doing it. We have to do it. And then I say to them, do you think that would be a defense argument in front of court that everyone else is doing it? You cannot risk doing this. And when you hear someone saying, well, we'll do it because this is how things are done here, huge red flag. Suspicious statements by the third parties, such as needing payments to take care of things or to finalize the deal, just wording as well, can be very illustrative. The third party requests approval of a significantly excessive budget or unusual expenditures. Are there any questions? I know there is a lot of information and I'm conscious about the time. But there is, are we okay with time? Yeah, okay. I also wanted to show you, we've just seen the red flags in working with third parties, uh, but I also wanted to show to you red flags in general terms. And this, you can find it in the Transparency International UK, how to bribe, a typology of bribe paying and how to stop it. If you haven't read this report, you have to read this. And I'm just basically going to explain to you what it says. So uh, adding a little bit of my experience, but you can find this in the Transparency International webpage. So typical red flags for corporations, and not only when hiring intermediaries to conduct business in the market. Cash payments, this is the typical one. Excessive hospitality, gift giving, Facilitation payments, donations, political donations, commissions, bribing through subcontracting or distributors, inflated invoices, offshore accounts, joint venture partners, per diem allowances, rebates, discounts, kickbacks, and employment contracts or consultancy agreements. I've already spoken about some of these in the previous part of the presentation, so I will just very quickly run through those. But let me show you some of the things you need to look at. Cash payments. What do you need to tell your people? First of all, avoid getting into a situation where you know you're going to be asked for a bribe because you see it in the international reports, you see it in the Transparency International map. These requests for cash bribes are prevalent in this country or industry. So ways to avoid this happening, build in longer lead delivery times to avoid being exposed to offers to speed up. This is a typical contractual clause. Companies, when contracting with foreign or public administration, they are forced to put in place very short delivery time of the products what that may encourage is actually your company paying bribes in the customs so that your goods pass through the customs faster than those of your competitors. So careful with the contract negotiation. You might not be conscious of this, but you need to tell the people that are negotiating your contracts. Careful because if you cannot commit to these deadlines, you're going to be applied what it's called liquidated damages or penalties for delays, but also you might be faced to a situation where they will ask you to pay bribes. Excessive hospitality, some red flags. First of all, is it in line with company policy? Excessive hospitality understood as invitation to hotels, invitation to dinners, lunch, trips, etc. Even entertainment, I'm inviting someone to come with me to the final of the World Cup. How much does that cost? Well, some people may consider that as a very preferential treatment and may decide to change their minds. Who knows, in order to award a contract to you. Who is being given hospitality? 
Could the hospitality influence the award or renew extent of a business contract? The person you are inviting tells you that they will have to take the day off because their companies or the public administration or the government will never allow them to go out to that event officially. Big red flag. Might competitors or a regulator think it is a bribe? Competitors, careful with perception again. There might be a rumor in the market which will make your companies to drop their shareholder value. How would this be perceived by others? For example, by the media. Set out precisely how much is acceptable. Again, look at the international consideration. Acceptable for lunch here might be $50. In Nigeria, it could be $1,000 or $3. We don't know, that's why I need to work with international organizations to let me know what's acceptable. Implement a review and approval process. To have clear limits is important, but it is as important to actually record where you spend the money or your employees spend the money. So apart from policies, you need to have control or procedures, formulaires, where they ask you for authorization for certain payments. Similar to entertainment, gift giving, could the gifts be considered excessive in value? Again, look at the country where you are operating. And then there are also uh, things you can actually Google and find examples. Mooncakes in China. Have you heard of mooncakes? There is a traditional um, festivity in China in mid-autumn, which is called, I don't know how to translate it, but it's when the moon shines brighter, just to give some color to this presentation. Traditionally, you would give cakes, pastry, with the form of a moon, when there have been bribing scandals because inside the pastry, they found certain elements of very high value, like gold. Or they would send 20 moon cakes together with little Rolex watches in the same box. Look at the international consideration. Mooncake seems inoffensive, but actually it could be offensive. So careful with that. Sorry. Who is being given a gift? Is it a public foreign official? Can the giving of a gift be seen as seeking to gain influence? We already spoke about this. Facilitation payment, why is this a big red flag? Because under the Foreign Corp Practice Act in the States, this is not forbidden. So many corporations in the past based their compliance programs on the Foreign Corp Practice Act in the USA. Actually, this is forbidden under almost all of the jurisdictions uh, around the world, or at least under many of them. What are facilitation payments? These are the small amounts of money you pay just to expedite. For example, uh, in certain countries, in order to get water access or access to water, you need to pay a small fee if you want to be put ahead in the list, in the waiting list. <clears throat> the typical example is the customs. So you pay a little amount in order to have your goods uh, pass the custom before uh, those of your competitors. Does the payment appear to be an official or convert in any way? Is the payment higher than or over and above the standard fee? Because these type of payments many times are permitted and they're publicized. Like if you pay $10, you will have a higher speed, which is fine if that is permitted under local legislation. But is what the person is asking you higher? than what is published, all of these things need to be taken into consideration. And there are also circumstances, and if you see this in a company policy, sorry, you need to uh, understand what it comes from. Many times in the company policies, there is an exception to payment of bribes, exception in the sense that you might be facing an employee who is being threatened in order to exit a country. So the public official in the border is asking him, her, to pay a certain amount in order to get out of the country as soon as possible. Obviously, it's subject to local legislation and subject to the legislation of your company. 
uh, you need to be very careful with that. And if that happens, you need to formalize it. Let the compliance council know that you pay that money and why. So one could be the health, for example. You are a telecom engineer and you are sent to the jungle in order to install antennas, but you have a heart condition for which you need medication. And you take your medication with you for the 15 days that the project is going to last. The project goes longer because you don't find the materials, because the local resources are scarce, etc. And you are being found without medication for your condition. So people need to send you medication from abroad because you don't find it in the jungle, usually this type of medication. There are countries where people tend to take advantage of that, and they will ask you for a certain amount of money in order to get your medication through the custom. That would be a typical facilitation payment, and this is a typical exception that you may find in company policies subject, obviously, to local legislation. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm just going to see if there's anything that uh, we haven't touched based on. Employment contracts and consulting agreements, again, that might be something of value to me. You are giving me employment or you are giving my daughter employment. I can be bribed if you give my daughter employment, not me, huh? hypothetical. But ensure that any employment contract consulting agreements are open and transparent. The person you are hiring needs to have the skills. Otherwise, what was the reason for hiring this person? Are you trying to pay a favor in some manner? So this is basically what you need to be thinking of when putting in place or due diligence in the contracts. So many thanks if you have any questions. Thank you for your speech. I think it has been very fruitful. And I would like to know if, two questions. If you think first, if the elements of uh, compliant programs are they fixed or are they flexible in order to adapt them to the company? And in the second hand, if um, you think we have, we can achieve in Spain a culture of compliance, as you explained. Culture of compliance? Yeah. I, Thank you. Okay. Let me answer the first one, then I'll answer the second question. Are the elements of a comp oh. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Are the elements of a compliance program firm or flexible? You need to have the elements that I described in Spain and in many jurisdictions in the world. Those are the minimum you need to have. So identify the risks, policies and procedures, uh, uh, supervisory board, training and development, etc. Those are the minimum. But I like your question because they have to be flexible in the sense that if there is additional risk or additional circumstances that are not contemplated in the legislation, either you put controls in place to prevent those or the compliance program will not be considered sufficient under Spanish legislation, for example. I don't know if that answer your, okay. Second question, do I think we can build a culture of compliance? I'm gonna be based I'm going to base this response in my experience in Italy, for example. Did I think in 2001 that corporations would abide by the legislative decree 231 uh, in order to prevent the criminal liability of the companies? Well, I had, we all uh, had doubts at the time in the sense that I thought my job was going to be very difficult, and it was. But they are 14 years ahead of us, and the corporations, at least, uh, at, least as, at corporate environment, do understand the need to put in place this type of measures. And I think my response conclusion would be, if we don't do anything, I don't think we will be created. So we need to do something to start creating this culture. Thank you. A uh, couple of methodological questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, which is the, the better strategy to guarantee the independency of the compliance officer of the compliance team? Uh, I think on two possibilities, to have something inside the organization, but then his post and his uh, appointment depends on the um, 
cooperation. So there's a risk there. And if you uh, outsource the compliance and you contract a um, low uh, firm or a compliance firm, uh, we all remember what happened with uh, Andrew Anderson as an audit of Enron. So which is the best strategy or which are the strategies? And the second question is about um, the, the corruption perception. If uh, you base your risk assessment or your compliance programs on this index of perception, uh, you could find certain distortions. I remember that the uh, European Anti-Corruption um, um, Report uh, focused on the situation in Spain where uh, there's a very generalized uh, perception of corruption, but uh, very few um, um, of the answering uh, persons um, that were confronted to corruption situations. Well, uh, in these cases, the perception uh, do not f um, fit with the reality and that introduced a distortion. Yeah, it, uh, very good questions, both of them. First of all, very passionate debate about where does compliance fit within the organization. And, um, there are two ways of doing this, as you explained, internal or external. But let me go to the internal first. Within the internal, there are different ways to do this. Compliance could report to the general counsel, to the responsible of the legal matters within the organization, or compliance could actually report at the same level that the general counsel, so directly to the board of directors, which is the risk you identified, it's gonna be them appointing the compliance officer. How independent is that? Or compliance could report directly outside of the organization in order to provide the insight that they need and the autonomy it's needed. Now, do I believe it needs to be internal or external? First of all, I believe, this is personal opinion, it should be separate from legal in order to warranty also the independence. When I say separate, I don't mean they don't work together. They have to be like this in order for compliance to be efficient. But I would say they need a separate reporting relationship. A small and medium companies, even the criminal code in Spain allows for the compliance officer to be the same board of directors. So how autonomous can you be there? Well, you need to do diligence and audit the people that are exercising that function. Benefits of having the compliance function internally, the knowledge of the company. I've done that 18 years and I knew exactly the operating mechanism of the company. And that's when you can identify the red flags. You know the product, you know the operating mechanism, you know it, everything. That's the big benefit of having it internally. Externally, the big benefit, first of all, the privilege under European law. The uh, in-house councils are not protected by privilege. They are, if they are external law firms. So in terms of investigation, you would want someone from outside to look into your model and clearly autonomous. But again, one could argue how autonomous is a law firm that has been appointed by the board and who is being paid by the company. So I know I didn't provide a, that's why your question is so good. There is not a fixed answer, but you need to look at the reality of your corporation to see how would it be more autonomous, either internally or externally. And then, uh, can you repeat, just remind me? Yes, the distortion oh, yeah. introduced by perception of yeah. corruption. Uh, to me, perception always has an ingredient of uncertainty. It's not based in, it's based in facts. If you read the Transparency International, I think you've read it, but I, I fully agree. It, it, it's, only an, it's only an element that you take into consideration. It may not mean you don't invest or you don't expand into that country. It's just that you need to put a special care when dealing with the public administration, even if the enforcement in the country may not match the legislation that it is in place. So it's true, there is an element of uncertainty in the sense that it's a perception and not a real, um, it's real, but a perception. So you need to, that's only one element of a risk analysis, you need all of the rest to be effective. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Maria, for your interesting presentation. Uh, we will provide the presentations uh, via link uh, uh, at the end of the of the visit. Hmm? Thanks. Thank you.
And now we have a coffee break here, just, just next, here, next door. And then we will have a presentation of uh, the public prosecutor that came today. Thank you.